the missing link and where dentists really should get involved is in the children, right? So um, I, I've asked uh, Dr. Dunlop uh, to do a talk today about what sort of um, uh, features you'd see in these children. Uh, to me, we all have children that um, are very difficult to manage in the chair. Who, who would agree? You know, whether you want to call it uh, attention deficit disorder or just disruptive kids, etc. But I think more and more you realise these kids actually have a form of sleep disorder, breathing. Right? Um, and um, Sorry. Are you live streaming too, or no? Yeah. It's on now. Okay, right. So um, I've just finished. Um, 15 years research uh, for my PhD. And my PhD looked at a condition called pediatric sleep apnea um, and also sleep disordered breathing. And I wanna just give you a quick uh, definition of that because it'll make uh, what we're talking about uh, tonight more sense as far as the dental point of view, right? So um, one of the uh, uh, very famous clinicians who helped me with the uh, data and more uh, importantly, the statistics uh, was Dr. Uh, David Gazal, and Dr. Gazal has just published this textbook, which is called Sleep Disorder Breathing in Children, and it covers the whole gauntlet of the problem, which includes um, obesity, um, uh, central and mediated sleep apnea, et cetera, et cetera. But the last chapter in this book, I don't know why it's the last chapter, it talks about um, orthopedic intervention, right? So what we realize from many classical papers is that if a child has this condition, um, you can actually treat it very effectively by widening the palate to open up the airway and also repositioning the lower jaw, right? and in some cases doing both. Um, so as an orthodontist, as a general dentist, uh, when you see a kid who has certain signs and symptoms, um, you may want to investigate a bit further with number one, an ear, nose and throat evaluation, uh, and number two, um, a pediatric sleep study. And um, what, are, what are some of the dental uh, manifestations you think a child who has sleep disorder breathing would have? Can someone open that up? P at night. Say so again? P? Yes. Um, so what we call uh, nocturnal enuresis, right? Uh, bedwetting. And um, uh, lots of research uh, by Dr. Kurol in Sweden to show development of the palate and expanding that bedroom actually increases the production of a hormone called ADHD, antidiuretic hormone, which automatically deals with the, the bedroom. Like, if you're an adult who has sleep apnea, you'll tend to get up once or twice to go to the toilet every night, right? Same thing, it's a control of smooth muscle. Mouth breathers, right? They have less control of smooth muscle and therefore increase uh, in constant problems, whether it's getting up to go to the toilet once or twice a night for a kid wetting their bed, absolutely, right? But not the question you'd normally ask at a first consult for a a dental patient, would you? Well, I don't know about Newtown, Nick, but uh, <laughs> Ned's in Newtown. I think anything goes there. <laughs> Is that your first question, Nick? That's why I have like to share that story. Can I share that story about the rubber band? Yes, you can. You can. No, maybe after, after, yeah. after the lecture. Ned, Ned will tell you how we uh, made lots of money selling rubber dam to a certain group of people in, um, in Newtown. Uh, no need for <laughs> dental work. But, right. <laughs> Made a lot of money that way. Yeah. Oh, you? Well, other than bedwetting, what, what other things? Common, more common things you'd see with these kids. Dental things was the question. You've got like dry, cracked lips. Yes, exactly. Uh, their teeth are dry, so their gingiva is often very Absolutely. Good anterior inflammation. In yes, they have more plaque on their front teeth than their posterior teeth. Perfect. Uh, I mean. Dry mouth, we all know what happens with adults with dry mouth and increased social sure. These kids who are mouth breathers have increased chance of mouth breathers gingivitis, more gummy smiles, right? What about the common, what about bruxism? That's what I was hoping someone would put their hand up. Hmm? Right? Bruxism in children, it's huge. Whole chapter in here. Um, and uh, the guy who's done most of the research in that field um, is uh, from Montreal. Uh, his name is uh, Dr. Uh, Levine. Uh, and uh, uh, what we're seeing in kids, they're not um, clenching their teeth and grinding because of stress, as many adults do. Um, it's related to the fact they're getting apneic events. Right? And what they're doing is bringing their jaw forward to open up their airway. So when you see a kid, four, five, six, you know, 
with extreme wear facets um, start thinking that maybe they have a pediatric airway problem, right? Okay, so what other dental things? Certainly bruxism is a big one, ISD, well, crying out. as well. Which is yeah, but that's a, that's a sorry. What, what about some dental thing? Any, any thoughts on that? Related to the desic desiccation, similar to desiccation. Yeah, the, the big one Crowding. also is a thing called GERD or okay. silent reflux. Yeah? You'll see the erosion on these kids. And again, very much related to constipation, smooth muscle control. I have a very good uh, pediatric sleep physician, Dr. Jim Papadopoulos, um, and he looks at these sleep studies like you wouldn't believe and picks up all of these things, which all makes sense when you start uh, looking at them, right? But I think from a behavior point of view, let's forget dentistry, um, you know, a kid who doesn't sleep well doesn't really become lethargic like um, we would if we don't get a good night's sleep. They start climbing the walls and they become hyperactive, right? So a lot of those disruptive kids, you know, they're sort of, uh, they come in for the consult and they're jumping up and down on your chair. Who, who has those? You have to start hiding all your study models because you know what's <laughs> going to happen. Those kids, right? Um, and whole chapter here, on ADHD and how more than 50% of children misdiagnosed with ADHD actually have sleep disorder breathing problems. Right? So I think um, the lecture tonight is going to look at um, you know what can we do to help these kids and the first thing is to diagnose the problem first. Right? Um, some ways of diagnosing sleep disorder breathing in children. Let, let me give you the one of the, by the way, I have a whole series of slides, which I'm happy to share with people. Just send me an email and I can give you all the papers under all the topics. This is my passion. I have it all very well documented from studies on bruxism, studies on bedwetting, um, and, and mainly the, the dental things that you need to look at. Um, but I want you to understand that sleep disorder sort of breathing is a lot more common than sleep apnea. So I'll just give you a differential diagnosis of that. So. Um, we are talking about uh, sleep disorder breathing and it includes a number of entities and the latest classification mm -hmm. adds one more entity and that is mouth breathing, right? So if you have a child who snores, uh, if you have a child who finds it hard to breathe through their nose, so the difference between sleep apnea and sleep disorder breathing when it comes to the nose you could have a child who labors to breathe, right? But doesn't have an apneic event. So if you're looking in your sleep study only at OSA, they will come back as totally normal, but they're absolutely not normal. Do you know what I'm saying? Think about if you're drinking water through a straw and I come and compress the straw, you're gonna to have to work harder to get that water. Does that make sense? And that's gonna affect your sleep. So in the same way, one of the big ones is upper airway resistance uh, syndrome. And in those um, patients, um, many of the times it involves you know, the throat um, uh, intervention, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the take home message, I guess, when I graduated from dental school, we were taught you only send someone to the orthodontist at the orthodontic age of 13 or 14. Make sense, right? And when I trained in, in London, um, we only saw kids at that age because by the time they came off the national health waiting list, they, they were already in permanent dentition. And the majority of treatment I did during my postgraduate training was to remove teeth on that individual and straighten their teeth. But what do you think removing teeth may have on their airway if their palate that's already narrow becomes narrower? Mm -hmm. right? um, and then I did a lot of retraction. Right? So the point we're saying now we want to see the kids at that age. The ideal age, evidence-based, seven to nine. Yes, you can see them earlier um, uh, for uh, things such as tongue ties and lip ties. Uh, yes, you can see them earlier for class three development. But by and large, the majority of the growth of the upper jaw um, is between seven and nine. I mean, look at this little girl, right? She's severely class two. Everyone can pick that, yes or no? Right? Mm -hmm. But would you believe that um, she's been told, or the parents have been told, not to go to see the orthodontist until she's lost these baby teeth and her second molars have erupted. Who would agree or disagree with that? I mean, look at the girl's palate, right? Um, how do you think she feels um, during Easter, is my next question. 
Right? She's probably really busy. Um, do you think? Do you think she has an increased chance of trauma with an overjet like that? But the main thing is, forget all that. This girl has sleep disorder, breathing problems, back such sleep apnea, and it's obvious to me when you just look at her face, when you look at her high palate, that girl needs intervention like yesterday, right? So what we're trying to build here is the ability for you to help diagnose these kids, right? Okay, how could we have diagnosed her with this problem? Because when you start talking to parents about a medical problem, all of a sudden it becomes a lot more important than will I give her um, straight incisors or bring the canines in? How do you think we confirm the diagnosis? Well, I think also, apart from just medical things, which sometimes people can be overwhelmed with, yep. they always want to talk about handsome and beauty. Yes. And I talk a lot of, and you look at the atacanthus of the eye, the droopy eye. Yep. I explain to them how the upper front teeth are probably the only teeth closest to the right position. They're actually moving up and further forward to make it more bucky to get the jaw room to come forward. And posture, head and neck. And if you start giving them a story, they actually want to run with it. Yeah, in fact, I think what Steve was saying, a good face is a good airway. Yeah. Right? And someone who has uncompromised nasal breathing tends to have good forward growth. I like the weird that philosophy. American guy who wrote a book called Why Raise Ugly Kids. So sure that's a good out. book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you miss the boat, where's Adit Bar? Adit is my maxillofacial surgeon, and one of the most common procedures we do is a bimax advancement osteotomy with a chip. But for what reason? in this girl's case, for her airway, right? She has severe sleep apnea. And the point we're saying is, um, when do you think she developed that facial morphology? She was a kid. Exactly. Three, four, so three. when they're a kid, you can do something to change it. I mean, that girl and that girl as a kid would have had the same malocclusion, what we call biskeletal retrusive long, right? So if a kid has a narrow palate, maxilla back, mandible back, um, and a long face, I guarantee you they have an airway problem. But if you can do as Steve was saying, this is classical bio-block therapy, which means you get the upper jaw further forward so that the lower jaw can come exactly where it needs to go. And, um, you know, it's a bit of a sell sometimes to the parents because a kid comes in with a 10 millimeter overjet and you're going to give them a 15 millimeter overjet before you bring the jaw forward. Does that make sense? Yeah. But that's because that's where their upper jaw needs to be. And this is the thing that, you know, we, we do a lot of here, right? So um, I think that's all I needed to say. I won't bore you with all the research we did. I will thank the lady who wrote the chapter here on orthopedics is that lady. Uh, Professor Maria Villa. Um, she um, really was instrumental in me doing this uh, research and uh, she teaches in Rome and she has very good documented research on um, orthopedics and also on a thing called um, myofunctional therapy. Has anyone heard of myofunctional therapy? No? Yes, no? Where's Nada? Nada, you want to stand up? Nada is my speech pathologist that comes in here and does um, myofunctional therapy. So what is myofunctional therapy? After I've developed the jaw and brought the jaws in the right position, we need the muscles to adapt to that new position. Does that make sense? Right? Um, I don't know whether you understand the literature, but one of the best ways to stop snoring and improve sleep apnea is to learn to play the didgeridoo. Right? Uh, did you know that? And for the same reason, the muscles that we are working are the muscles of the palate and the pharynx, et cetera, et cetera. So to me, what we do with kids, we see them early, we develop their jaws to the dimensions they should be, and then we retain them until they get permanent dentition. And part of our retention is this myofunctional um, therapy, right? And that's an important part uh, because I've done lots of arch development to find five years later the kids back to where they started. Does that make sense? But what we call um, uh, relapse. So that's an important um, part of, of, of the deal. So um, I now will, yeah, that was it. One more slide. Oh, that's what I'm dead against, right? Um, children who have sleep apnea, but are put on CPAP. Now CPAP 
is very important initially just to get the kid out of the danger zone. But long term, what does CPAP do? This study by Professor Christian Gumino, who has recently passed away, um, uh, he showed that long term CPAP therapy affects forward growth of the upper jaw. So you're actually creating a bigger problem. Does that kind of make sense? I know when I did a lot of cleft palate training, we repaired the cleft foot and palate very early, right? And that was good for feeding and good for, you know, the uh, parental um, relationship, but it affects the growth of the jaw. So all these kids end up like this because the early repair of the cleft foot and palate affects growth of the jaw. CPAP affects growth of the jaw. So you're gonna end up with a kid with that sort of face, right? And then she'll be on CPAP forever or she'll end up seeing added bowel for what she really needs, which is a jaw move for, right? However, if you can wean them off the CPAP, um, and weaning the correct word, you need CPAP initially, it's important, but you wanna wean them off that and get them into the right appliances to move their jaws. And that's really the important aspect of what we do um, uh, here, right? So, um, I will, do you need to swap the slides over or something? I'll, now, I'm gonna say Gillian, Gillian, I knew I had 50-50 on that, right? Because, where's, where's the other Gillian? There's a, where's Chris Kelly? The lady who does all our sleep studies, her name is spelt like yours, so she calls herself Gillian. So it's Gillian, yes. right, okay. So Gillian Dunlop is um, uh, more famous as an artist than she is as an as a throat doctor. Does anyone know that? Huh? Her work um, has been um, hung in the Archibald Prize. Uh, so um, she does portrait painting and does it really, really well. Um, I'll show you my one, for instance. <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, but uh, her passion is, uh, other than that, is obviously early intervention and diagnosis of these kids, right? So she's gave you a talk on you know, the sort of kids that she's referred to and really a change in their behavior. We're talking about their teeth, we're talking about their face, but she's talking about their behavior. To give you an idea, um, an average IQ, average, is 90, okay? Einstein was about 120, yeah? Um, if a kid has some sort of breathing and it's undiagnosed, every year they're gonna drop between five and 10 IQ points. Does that make sense? Yeah. And they'll never recover from that, yeah? So I think this is the other big thing that we wanna um, uh, discuss and, and, and address, right? So can I hand over to you? Now, this can go around your ear or you can hold it. With oh, no, I'll hold it. Perfect. Great. Uh, hello, I'm Gillian Dunlop from Sydney Adventist Hospital and Huntersville Private Hospital. And with me tonight is Greg, who's the father Hi. of Alex and James, two of my patients. And he's going to give his perspective from a parent's point of view. Now, what we'll do tonight is I'll show my video on kids and sleep apnea. I made it several years ago because I was frustrated by the lack of awareness about sleep apnea in kids in the general community and even in the medical community. Now fortunately, the dental community is much more aware because of the impact of nasal obstruction on dental architecture. So I'll show this video first and then Greg and I are going to have a Q&A session about his kids, their symptoms, the treatment and the outcomes of the treatment. And then Greg will show his videos of his children plus some parameters that he's measured, and then we'll open up the floor for questions. So I'll start first with the video. And, yeah. Okay, so we'll just look at that. Yeah, and then we'll Hello, I'm Dr. Gillian Dunlop, ear, nose and throat surgeon. Most people think of tonsillectomy as a treatment for recurrent tonsillitis. But these days, I do five times as many tonsillectomies for sleep apnea as I do for tonsillitis. I decided to create a video on tonsillectomy for sleep apnea in children, as there is very little practical information on this important topic for parents and family doctors. It's important to raise awareness about sleep apnea in children because leaving it untreated can have a profoundly negative impact on their future development. Everybody wants what's best for their kids, 
So I will explain the what, the why and the how. What is sleep apnea? Why do we need to treat it? And how do we assess and treat it? What is sleep apnea? Obstructive sleep apnea is a loss of airflow and oxygen supply to the brain. The snoring you hear in this child with sleep apnea is due to the enlarged tonsils. The tonsils are on either side of the tongue and the adenoid is up behind the soft palate. The tonsils and the adenoids are enlarged not because of recurrent tonsillitis, but because of a genetic predisposition or possibly frequent coughs and colds. The tonsils and adenoids enlarge just before the age of two, so most kids with sleep apnea will start snoring around this time. A smaller percentage of children will start snoring ages seven to nine. In these kids, allergy or obesity may play a role. Here is a typical two-year-old with sleep apnea. See how he tilts his head and neck back to stretch the airway open. You can hear him struggling to breathe past the big tonsils. At times he stops breathing. If he sleeps with you in your bed, he will kick all night because kids with sleep apnea are restless as the oxygen level drops. He may be sweaty because of adrenaline and other hormones his body is producing to maintain the oxygen supply. Kids with sleep apnea can be skinny because they're burning up calories at night, working hard to breathe. If it's really bad, you see the chest wall sucked inwards. And these kids live on a mushy diet, like yogurt, cheese and pasta, because it's easier to swallow slippery food past the big tonsils. Bulky food, like meat, can make the little ones gag or spit. So why do we need to treat sleep apnea? If you leave sleep apnea untreated, it will have impact on the developing brain. Adults with sleep apnea become tired and forgetful, whereas kids get hyped up, but they can be tired and cranky at the beginning and the end of the day. In 2010, the University of Chicago did a research study. They found that kids with sleep apnea had impaired acquisition and retention of picture-based memory tasks for immediate and overnight recall. They concluded that as uptake of new material was impaired, kids with sleep apnea needed more time and more learning opportunities to keep pace with the healthy kids. A similar study was done in Boston. The results were even more impressive. That study demonstrated that kids with sleep apnea who were evaluated at the age of four, then re-evaluated at the age of eight with no treatment, had impaired literacy and numeracy skills equivalent to a 10 point drop in their IQ. So how do we assess and treat it? 12% of kids snore, but only 3% have sleep apnea. So who are the kids at risk? If your child has the symptoms that I've described, that's a concern. Take an iPhone video of your child snoring and see your family doctor. Your doctor will examine your child for enlarged tonsils and a blocked nose, which can be due to enlarged adenoids. If your child doesn't breathe through the nose, the mouth remains open and the lips become dry. Little kids can dribble. Others get dark rings under their eyes. The palate shrinks upward, so the doctor will look for a high arch palate. Having a high arch palate crowds the teeth, so the doctor will look for a crossbite, which is where the teeth are angled inwards. They may also ask about sleep apnea in relatives, like grandparents, because sleep apnea can be hereditary. If you're ticking all the boxes, your local doctor may refer your child for a sleep study or suggest you go directly to an ear, nose and throat surgeon. The surgeon may also consider a sleep study as this is the most solid evidence that your child needs a tonsillectomy. 
The definitive treatment for sleep apnea is tonsillectomy and the removal of adenoids, which together is called adenotonsillectomy. What your child needs is a bigger airway. Because of their increased growth rate, the tonsils and the adenoids are occupying too much space. Don't worry, you can live without your tonsils. The tonsils and adenoids are just three of 120 lymph glands we have in the head and neck to fight infection. Without tonsils, you can still fight disease. In fact, after adenotonsillectomy, parents often comment that coughs and colds are of shorter duration. This is due to the better drainage because of the larger airway. Tonsillectomy involves an overnight stay in hospital. Though some kids, older than the age of three, can go home on the day of surgery, as long as they're eating well. Kids eat well if their pain is under control. Most kids need regular Panadol for five to seven days with a stronger medicine called Oxynorm at night and first thing in the morning. The kids need two weeks off school to reduce the risk of bleeding, which runs at about 1% in this age group. The best way to avoid bleeding is to make sure your child isn't taking any blood thinning agents like Nurofen, fish oil and vitamin E in the two weeks prior to surgery. It's normal to have a cough, temperature and referred pain to the ears after the surgery. Some kids snore for four to five days due to the swelling, but what most parents notice is how quiet the breathing is at night. Here is our same little friend after surgery. After two weeks, parents often comment that the child is more rested and settled in the daytime. Mum and Dad are being woken less at night too. After three months, parents often notice that the child is eating more and has grown. This is due to the growth hormone which is produced now more regularly in the deep sleep cycle. Tonsillectomy restores normality for these children. If you are concerned that your child has sleep apnea, see your local doctor, but take an iPhone video with you. Tonsillectomy for sleep apnea can have a profoundly positive impact on the rest of a child's life. Thanks. Uh, as you can see, that was pitched mainly at parents because personally I found that the parents teach the GPs. It's mm -hmm. a sad truth, but that is the way that it goes. Uh, people study at university and then they're in practice and they really just have to come in contact with some sort of educational session like tonight before they thoroughly understand it. Now that video um, is, as I said, on my website, so I'm Gillian Dunlop, not Gillian, Gillian, and uh, what I'll do next is I'll, um, oh sorry, uh, I'll just highlight some red flags for you. Uh, let's say you're a dentist or an oral, oral hygienist, oral myologist, as Derek was saying before, you'd be thinking sleep apnea if you see things like dry lips, crowded teeth, crossbite, high arch palate, or if you're here tonight as a speech therapist, if you see that open mouth posture with the tongue forward position, you'd start to think sleep apnea. And if the child has a global speech delay rather than something more specific, you're starting to think, well, why is this child not learning? First thing a kid's got to learn is how to walk. Second thing they've got to learn is how to talk. Now, if there's some sort of delay in learning, you're starting to think, well, what's going on? Now, questions to ask, as Derek listed, do they wake at night? Are they restless, kicking? Do they have their head and neck tilted back? That is the number one symptom. Lots of people think it's snoring. A third of kids don't snore with sleep apnea. The number one symptom is the tilting back of the head and neck like you saw the toddler in the video. And sleeping on the tummy is a very good way to stretch your head and neck out. So uh, be suspicious of that. And night terrors, that's REM rebound. So if you don't have regular REM sleep, you may get some REM rebound, and in that REM sleep you have your dreams. So you'll have very colourful dreams, and that's the night terrors. Uh, sweaty or hot, 
I think that's the adrenaline they pour out when they start to drop their oxygen. Uh, cranky on waking, well they're just not rested, you know, their sleep has been fragmented throughout the night. And do they have trouble eating meat? That's something you only ask the parents of little children. Uh, it would probably only be relevant up to about the age of three and a half or four. So the tonsils are quite large and they just can't push a meat bolus past it. Now, uh, this video is not mine. It belongs to the Wilcox Sleep Institute, but they're happy for us to show it to you. Derek referred to the children that jump up and down in your office. We've all had them, but next time you see a child who's very poorly behaved, once again, think sleep apnea. Everyone's always going, where's Mitchell? Where's Mitchell? What's he doing? Because he was always up to something. He kick and scream and smack and try to bite me. And Everyone's always going, where's Mitchell? Where's Mitchell? What's he doing? Because he was always up to some. Yeah. We might pass on that video because um, Greg has some video footage of his kids uh, doing much the same thing. But uh, what we'll do now is Greg and I will have a Q&A session about his kids. We can do it if you want. Oh, okay. All right. If it's up and running. Yeah, I think we're yeah. right. Everyone's always going, where's Mitchell? Where's Mitchell? What's he doing? Because he was always up to something. He kick and scream and smack and try to bite me. And in the end, there'd be times where I was like pleading <laughs> I'd have tears. And in the end, we just really didn't leave the house. We didn't have too many offers to babysit. But <laughs> I did think, because I had lots of people telling me as well that he could be on the ADHD scale because he was just so hyperactive. I was feeding him one day and I noticed, I thought, oh wow, his tonsils, wow, your tonsils are really big. And I thought, well, maybe this needs further investigation. So I took him to the GP. She referred us to an ear, throat and nose specialist, Dr. Dunlop. She had seen video of him snoring. Um, she thought that perhaps he wasn't getting enough air, perhaps he wasn't getting into a deep enough sleep so she recommended a sleep study. We saw Dr. Seaton at the sleep clinic and we spent the night there. He let them wire him up and I just laid with him and um, yeah, he fell asleep and was snoring, but he actually never woke up, like he never cried out. In fact, if he was at home, we would have thought it was a good night. Um, the study showed that he was waking up something like 26 times an hour and that his oxygen level was dropping down to 80% overnight. So he was diagnosed with a moderate sleep apnea and it was recommended that his tonsils and adenoids be removed. By this stage that we were well aware that tonsils and adenoids were linked to sleep apnea and sleep apnea is linked to behaviour. So we thought finally we had an answer to his uh, behaviour problems. To be honest, I wasn't convinced it still would be the answer, but I would say three months, we started to see a big improvement in his behaviour. And today he really is like a different boy. I can't stop telling people, especially um, parents with boys who are a little bit difficult, I, I keep saying to them now, have you had their sleep checked? Because perhaps if Mitchell had been my eldest, I wouldn't have known. You know, that's what I, I only would have known. But I knew his behaviour wasn't normal and I'm very glad that we got that diagnosis. It's just 
changed my life so much. I wake up in the morning and I can't wait to play with him. Just seeing his personality emerge. He's such a loving and caring and a funny, funny little guy. So we really have got a lovely little boy and we're just very, very grateful. So this is Greg and his kids are James and Alex. Uh, 